Hey, everybody, JJ here. Welcome back for another Saturday of Zoom Networking. Really excited to have you guys here. And uh, today we have none other than the fantastic, wonderful, talented, charming Paige Panzarello. JJ, thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here today. And as you know, I'm going to be talking about the wonderful world of notes and note investing. Oh, Paige, I, your topic is fantastic. You're fantastic. So without any further ado, Paige, take it away. Okay, so as everybody knows, I am Paige Panzarello. I'm the cash flow chick. Uh, I am so, so excited to be here. As I mentioned earlier, I have been a real estate investor for over, well, just about 25 years, give or take. Uh, and I've done just about everything there is to do in real estate investing. Now, interestingly enough, when I first started, I did not choose real estate. Real estate chose me. Uh, I was young. I was in my mid twenties and, uh, my grandmother passed away. She had a very sizable estate, uh, with holdings in both Arizona and California. And this very sizable estate was $4 million in debt, uh, in just the Arizona properties. Um, we had a, a 38 unit townhome complex. We had a sewer treatment plant, and then we had some land, uh, and, Unfortunately, the townhome complex was only about 40% occupied. Um, the other 60% were either broken, meaning they weren't habitable, um, or they were just in a state of disrepair that no one would want to live in them. Uh, so I went to Arizona knowing nothing about real estate or real estate investing, had no idea about fixing and flipping or any of those things. And um, I, I surrounded myself with people when I got there uh, with the answers to the questions that I had to ask. Now, at the time, obviously, there, there weren't groups like this. There wasn't really a support system. So I had to be very bold and fearless um, in order to get the job done. Well, fast forward, I was able to uh, put that company back in the black. Uh, I worked with people that I owed money to. I came up with a plan, and then I executed the plan. Uh, within 18 months, we were 100% occupied. All of the units had been fixed um, and renovated. So I was fixing and flipping, in essence, before I even knew what that was. Um, and, and I realized, even though we were 100% occupied and doing very well, I realized that we weren't going to be able to sustain that profitability uh, because of, of the rents. The area uh, was not allowing me to um, command the rents that we needed to command in order to stay profitable. So I went to my family and, and we sold the sewer treatment plant. I went to the family and I said, I want to sell all these units off and I want to build on the land. And my family said, that's great, Paige, but we don't want to do that. So I said, all right, well, then I want to buy the company, which I did. Um, I leveraged some of those townhome units. I put some loans in place. And sure enough, I bought the corporation from my family. And I decided to, to build a project on that land. Well, I didn't know anything about construction. I didn't know anything about building. I didn't know any of that. So I sat down with a, a, an architect and a, and a contractor and we developed the plan um, and got it through the approval process with the county and we started to build. And I realized very quickly that that contractor was gonna bankrupt me before I even came out of the ground. So I fired him and I started my own construction company. Again, knowing nothing about construction, uh, I found it, someone to come in and be a shareholder in my corporation. The corporation held all of the licenses uh, for our construction. Um, and the only thing we didn't have, we had residential and commercial, um, all of those required licenses. The only thing we didn't have was HVAC and roofing. And we grew to 36 employees. Um, I, we built everything under the sun, my own projects, everybody else's projects. We had high-end custom homes, et cetera. Um, and I will tell you, everybody, that that as wonderful as all of that sounds, and I was making money hand over fist, but I was stuck in Arizona, away from my friends and family, and I was working myself 18 hours a day, seven days a week. The stress alone was putting me in an early grave. And I was smart with my money because I invested it in other things. I didn't just go hog wild and spend it, spend it right? So when the crash started to appear, I, I saw that it was going to come. I saw that it was headed our way uh, just because of the way that things were in the market. 
But I thought to myself, well, that's not going to happen to me. And I was wrong. Um, I, my thought process was that I had great developed relationships with lenders. I had only 10% encumbrance in my in all of my projects and my et cetera. And I thought it's not going to happen. I did not anticipate that the people that owed me money, and when you're in construction, you carry the bill anywhere between 90 and 120 days. Um, and so I was running payroll um, at $25,000 per week. And that was just payroll. That's not even expenses. Um, so I was really underwater when the crash happened and people couldn't pay me. It put me in a really bad position. So I thought to myself, okay, Paige, you have a lot of assets. You have a lot of liquidity. You can do one of two things. You can either file bankruptcy, which was within my legal right to do, um, and, and just, you know, try and salvage what I could or sell everything at rock bottom fire sale prices and pay everybody off that I owed money to. I chose option number two. Um, it took me three years. I, I paid everybody that I owed money to and they were willing to work with me, which was great. But at the end of the three years, I walked out of Arizona having lost $20 million. Now, that's a massive amount of money. And I don't mean to be cavalier about it, but I do consider it a blessing. And that sounds crazy, but it taught me some things. It taught me who I am as an investor. It taught me how I engage and, and interact and treat people. It taught me how what my risk tolerances are. It taught me how I treat money um, because you treat it very differently when you go through something like that. So it really was a very difficult learning experience but it was also a blessing in disguise. Um, clearly, I went away from real estate investing for a, a little while. I had to lick my wounds. And then when I came back, um, I it just is my passion. So I, I wanted to come back in. I started doing what I normally did. I started buying properties. I was wholesaling. I was fixing and flipping, getting my capital back up. But I had heard about this thing called notes. And I thought, huh. What is that? And the more I learned, the more I loved, right? So let's get into what is a note. A note, everybody, is basically just a promise to pay, okay? It is, it is somebody's uh, promise that when they borrow the money, that they are going to pay you back. That is what a note is. When you are a notes investor, yes, you really become somebody's bank, OK, so what you do is you're actually buying that promise to pay now and you become that person's bank. There are different types of notes, OK, uh, that you can buy. There are performing notes, which is just like it sounds. If the person uh, is paying their their either their mortgage or their credit card debt or their car payment, that's a performing note. There are non-performing notes, non-performing notes is exactly what it sounds like. That person has stopped paying their monthly payment for whatever reason. Um, there are first position liens, there's second position liens, there's HELOCs. Uh, there are, there's unsecured and secured. So I invest in first position, non-performing notes secured by real estate, okay? I, I don't have a risk tolerance anymore to be bold and unsecured. I prefer to be secured by real estate, not by anything that can be picked up and moved or driven away. Um, I preferred the first position non-performing notes that are secured by real estate. Now that sounds counterintuitive, right? Why on earth would I buy a non-performing note? Um, I'm in this to make some money. Well, I make my money because, and I focus on non-performing notes, because I am able to take the current market value of the securing collateral, which is the house, and discount my purchase price at a, at a large discounted rate off of that current market value of the house. I do not buy notes based on how much money is owed. And the reason for that is because most of these properties are underwater, meaning the borrower owes more money than the house is actually worth if they had to sell it, 
Okay. So I use the collateral, the house, and I discount it from there. When I do that, and I'm going to show you some numbers in a few minutes, but when I do that, I build in a really big cushion of equity. So no matter what happens in the note market, I am able to pivot and mitigate my risk because I've already built in that big cushion of equity, okay? All right, um, is there competition in note investing? Yes, of course there is competition in note investing, just like anything else. I like to call it the simpler and more gentle form of real estate investing. The reason that I say that is that, that I'm not, and especially times right now, everybody, we're in crazy times right now. People are overbidding asking price by $100,000. Um, bidding wars have gone uh, run amok, right? Um, and, and, and the competition is fierce. In the note investing space, it's very collaborative, but it's also very gentle. Um, even though there is competition, it's gentle. I get a tape, it's called a tape, which is basically just an Excel spreadsheet that comes directly to my inbox. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, and, and I evaluate the assets on that tape and then I make my offer. Now my asset manager, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, is going to either counter my offer, accept my offer or reject my offer. There's none of this crazy bidding war stuff that goes on. And oftentimes note investors, if you have to buy um, everything, it's called a pool buy. If you have to buy everything that's on that tape, sometimes us note investors get together and we'll go in together and buy that whole tape. Um, so it's very collaborative. Yes, there is competition, competition, but it's nothing like you see in your other typical forms of real estate investing. Um, okay, so how do I find deals? This is an important one, everybody. I pay zero dollars marketing for deals. Zero. I do not do bandit signs. I do not do yellow letters. I don't knock on doors. I don't drive for dollars. I don't ever leave and, and go visit the properties. Um, I, I don't do any of that stuff. No marketing dollars spent to find deals. Deals literally come to my inbox. Well, how do you make that happen, Paige? Well, I spend my money going to conferences and networking with people. That's how I find deals. I will go to conferences. I will go to subgroups of, of RIA meetings, groups like this, like JJ's group. Um, I talk about what I do. And, and oftentimes there are asset managers. And when I say asset managers, that means people that have product to sell, whether it's a bank, a hedge fund, um, a, another note investor, a broker, I call them all asset managers. And I just make relationships with these asset managers. They know the criteria that I'm looking for, for the notes that I buy, and they send them directly to my inbox, okay? It's free. I don't, I don't pay, you don't pay for tapes. They come to your inbox for free when you develop the relationships. And that's how you find the deals in note investing. So one of the important things for me when I got into the note investing space is that I didn't want to be stuck in a physical location. Oftentimes in other typical forms of real estate investing, especially things like fixing and flipping, you most of the time have to ha have to be there, right? I was stuck in Arizona away from my family for years. So when I came back in and I got to the note space, I was thrilled to learn that I can literally do this business anywhere in the world as long as I have an internet connection and a cell phone. That is it. Um, I literally have the freedom to be anywhere in the world and conduct my business, which is really cool. Okay, so we're in some interesting times. I wanted to talk to you tonight about, well, today, um, about the times that we are in, uh, because unfortunately, the world is hurting. Unfortunately, our country is hurting, and there are people that are hurting in all of these different areas, okay? Okay. It's sad for me to say it breaks my heart. Um, it also poses amazing opportunities for us note investors. Now, I am gonna talk about one of our exit strategies in a few minutes. My favorite is to be able to help people, to, to buy the note and be able to help people get back on their feet and start to reperform again. I give them a second chance. And as a note investor, with there, there's a wave of product coming 
unfortunately, because people are hurting and they can't afford their mortgages. I'm going to show you some numbers here in just a second. Um, and I'm going to be as a note investor in a unique position where I get to build my wealth while helping people stay in their homes. OK, now you don't have to have that same exit strategy there. Are, if you are a fix and flipper and you want the home. Awesome. There's a way to do that. And we're going to talk about that in a minute as well. I just would hope that you would go after notes that are already vacant. The house has already been vacated because I can tell you it's not fun kicking families out of their homes. OK, um, but it's a great way. I call it the backdoor way of, of fixing and flipping because there's a great way. Um, to be able to acquire these properties and and make and, and to build your wealth and make quite a quite a nice return on your investment. Okay, all right. So current market trends. Now these are numbers. Uh, the numbers for Q3 have not been compiled yet. They haven't been completed. They're being compiled right now. So I use June. All right. So end of Q2, June of 2021. We have now. This is just my little niche, right? Single family residences, one to four. First position liens. These are not seconds, HELOCs. This is not land, mobile homes, commercial, resident, or um, industrial, none of it. Just first position, non-performing notes uh, secured by residential homes. Uh, and and the, like I said, first position liens. Okay. So at the end of June 2021, we had 62.17 billion with a B dollars in bad debt in just my little niche. Okay. This is after, understand these numbers are after forbearance agreements have been put in place, but before the moratoriums had started to be lifted. Moratoriums were being lifted in June, I mean, excuse me, July, August, and September. Okay. So that $62.17 billion in bad debt is before it, when people were in more in, in the forbearance agreements, um, which basically in a forbearance agreement is just a deferred payment plan. That's what a forbearance agreement is. Okay. Um, and before the moratoriums the had been lifted. Okay. So watch what happens. And these are some headlines that, that I brought up just recently. There's some from September. Uh, the foreclosure rate for the second month in a row. So this is in September. So meaning July and August. Uh, for the second month in a row, re recorded a 27% increase in foreclosure filings, everybody. 27% in two months, okay? October, just in Michigan, I pulled this because it was really important. Foreclosure filings jumped 65% in Michigan in two months. From where it was last year at that same time, 143% increase. That is staggering, everybody. People are really going to be in trouble. Um, foreclosed homes uh, Q, Q2 and Q3. Now we're in Q3 of 2021. We're looking at Nevada and Illinois having some of the highest. One in every 1,400 homes is being foreclosed on right now. In Delaware, um, and also in New Jersey, we're looking at one in 1,500, one in 1,600 homes. That's a staggering amount of foreclosures and product coming to the market. Sad for our country, great for note investors. This is an opportunity that, that you missed in 2008. It's here again, okay, on steroids. Um, and we've, we've just now just scratched the teeny little top of the surface. I think that we're going to have a massive amount of product coming uh, over the course of the next several years. OK, so that being said, um, here's another here's another headline. Now, this was back in 2020 when the when COVID first hit and the moratorium started being put in place. There is a company, a hedge fund out there called Oak Tree Capital. Oak Tree Capital is run by a gentleman named Howard Marks. It has $19.4 billion under management. It is ginormous. They started, now they had all different types of holdings in that fund. They started in 2020 a, a fund that was seeking to raise $16 billion just to buy non-performing notes, everybody. They're not stupid, right? They see the writing on the wall. 
So I'm hoping that you're kind of seeing the big picture of the opportunities that are just about to hit our market. Okay. Okay. So let's talk some numbers just to give you kind of a baseline. Um, and these are going to be really simple numbers. It's just an example. Um, when I first started buying notes, I was buying notes. Again, I buy on the securing collateral, right? At a discounted rate. Um, I was buying notes anywhere between 36 and 42, 46, 48 cents was the top, was the highest um, on the dollar. So if a house was worth $100,000, the securing collateral, I was buying anywhere between 36,000 and 48,000, okay? When I, as I've grown, pricing has gone up, of course, but it's also on its way back down right now, okay? So easy math we're gonna use today because it's Saturday. <laughs> Unpaid principal balance, that's just the base of the loan that it does not include any default interest or fees or anything like that, just the principal portion, $100,000. The legal collectible balance, that is, remember I said I buy non-performing notes. So they've been not, they haven't been paying for a couple of years, sometimes even more. Um, so there's there's missed payments, default interest. Oftentimes we as the note holder can pay payments uh, on, on property taxes and that becomes a recoverable expense. Um, so the borrower will owe us that money, okay? So the legal collectible balance is $120,000. That's the total amount of money that is due, okay? The current market value of the securing collateral, however, remember what I said, even though 120 is due, this for this example, the house is only worth 80. So our borrower is $40,000 in debt and from the get-go. That is they that's very daunting to a borrower. They don't know how they're going to pay that, right? So it they they kind of go into a little shell and hide and hope it goes away because it's it's overwhelming. Now again, even though $120,000 is owed, I will use the $80,000 as my baseline to put my purchase in place, okay? So I'm gonna use easy numbers at 50%. So I'm gonna buy this note that I've, I'm have i owed 120 for $40,000, okay? 50% of $80,000 is $40,000. Now, much like fixing and flipping, we have rehab costs in fixing and flipping. We have workout costs that are very similar to rehab costs in the note space, right? We have to, we have some external team members that we pay, servicing companies that we pay, loss mitigation team. So there are some rehab costs that we incorporate into our numbers when we're evaluating a note. Again, for easy numbers, I'm going to use $5,000. Generally, it's anywhere between $5,000, $5,500, and $8,500, depending upon a judicial versus non-judicial foreclosure state. We're going to talk about that in a moment, too. So I'm all in for this note at $45,000, okay? Again, immediately I have built-in equity because I know that the house is worth 80. I'm owed 120, but the house is worth 80. If I had to quickly sell it right here and now, that's what I could get for it. So I have a built-in cushion immediately of $35,000. Any amount of money over $80,000 that I make is, a, is a, the cherry on top of the sundae. It's kind of an extra freebie that we weren't expecting, right? And that does happen. I'm gonna show you that in just a second, okay? So I, I build in a cushion, I'm mitigating my risk. I've already mitigated my risk. Also, if the market drops, because we know that real estate corrects. So if the market drops, I already have a $35,000 built-in cushion of equity, so I can sustain that kind of, if, if it drops a little bit. As we all know in fixing and flipping, if we have a 15% drop in, a, in our market in a period of six months that it takes us to fix that house, we could possibly be in trouble, right? Not so in, this, in the note space because we buy our, our notes based on that big discounted rate, okay? And we build in equity. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these different exit strategies. We have 23 different exit strategies in note investing. Um, we typically use four, okay? My least favorite of the four is foreclosure. Uh, we do have 50% of the country is a judicial state, 
50% of the country is a non-judicial foreclosure state. Judicial means that you have to go to court and get the court's blessing to conduct the foreclosure. That typically takes a longer period of time. And in some states, it takes exponentially longer. So as a note investor, I avoid certain states. New York is one of them. The reason for that is that not that New York has bad assets because they have great assets, but it takes four to five years to get through a foreclosure in New York. That is not my highest and best use of my time or money. I like to be in and out of notes between 12 and 16 months or less, right? So when I know that New York takes four to five years, I'm not even going to waste my most valuable asset, which is my time looking at assets in New York, okay? However, Ohio, I love assets in Ohio, and Ohio is a judicial foreclosure state. Now, they're, they used to be between eight and 12 months. They've crept up a little bit. They're taking anywhere between 12 and 16 months now. But again, I've gotten some great assets and some, some very profitable ventures by assets that I bought in Ohio, okay? Now, Again, Ohio can take judicial foreclosure states can take anywhere between these days between 12 and 16 months. Non-judicial foreclosures take around six months. Okay. Obviously, people vie more for the non-judicial foreclosure state, but understand that they're missing out on some opportunity by being willing to wait a little bit longer in a judicial foreclosure state. Okay. All right. Now, what happens, let's say we've done our evaluation and in our example, we know that our house is worth $80,000, but we're really motivated to not have this property come back to us as an REO. So we as the bank, because we are the bank, just call me Mrs. Chase, right? We as the bank, are um, we set our opening bid, okay? We only get one bid and it's the opening bid. So let's say we want to move this house. We set our opening bid at $70,000 and it sells to a third party. Well, we didn't get the 80,000 we were expecting, but we did get the 70,000. That's a 25% or excuse me, $25,000 return on transaction. Now, if that's a non-judicial foreclosure state, that's typically gonna be in six months or less, right? So you guys can do the math. All right, short sale is another one of our uh, exit strategies that we use on a very regular basis. Generally, a short sale will take anywhere from three to six months. Now, any of you that were fixing and flipping or buying properties back in 2010, 11, 12, if you remember that, it took some banks 18 plus months to agree to a short sale. If my borrower comes to me and says, you know what, I have a neighbor that wants this house. I owe you $120,000, Mrs. Chase but this neighbor's willing to pay $90,000, are you willing to short the sale and forgive $30,000 worth of debt? How fast am I going to say yes, right? About that fast. Well, that snap didn't work, <laughs> but about that fast, right? It's not gonna take me 18 seconds, much less 18 months. So, the, and there's a variety of opportunity for you as a note investor um, to, to exercise any and all of these options, okay? Deed in lieu of foreclosure is our third uh, option that is, that is most readily used and most often used. A deed in lieu of foreclosure is when our borrower comes to us and says, you know what, Mrs. Chase, I can't stay in this house. It's too overwhelming or I have too many bad memories, whatever the case may be, but I don't want a foreclosure on my record. So will you take this house? I will sign the deed over to you. Will you take this house as payment in full for my loan? Okay. Now I talk at the workshop about a lot of the pitfalls because that sounds great, but there are some pitfalls. Namely, if you accept the deed as, as payment in full for your loan, so you're taking possession of the actual house. If there's any junior liens behind you, remember, I invest in the first position. I like to get paid first. Um, but if there's any junior liens behind you, now everybody, your loan goes away because you've been paid in full by taking the house and everybody behind you moves up a, state, a step and you as the homeowner are now responsible for those liens. So there's lots of due diligence that we talk about at the workshop that goes over everything to look for and the pitfalls to avoid. But a deed in lieu of foreclosure can take a relatively short amount of time, three to six months, sometimes less. 
Um, and now we have the property, okay? We can sell it as an REO for the $80,000 that we were expecting to get. We could fix and flip it ourselves. We can turn it into, you know, fix it and turn it into a rental, short-term rentals. How about this one? I do this a lot, especially um, in our community. I will take a property back as an REO, and then I'm going to sell it and carry the paper. So I become the lender again for a fix and flipper, right? So now I'm making money twice on the same asset. There's so many different things that you can do in this type of situation. And again, you're, you're kind of going at it at the back door, right? You're really building in a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of in return on transaction, right? Your profit, your profit goes up. Now, again, in this situation, so we sell it for $80,000 as an REO, let's just say, now we've made our $35,000 in three to six months, okay? It might take a little bit longer, might take a little less time, but we're not swinging hammers. We're not, unless you choose to fix and flip it yourself, um, we're not doing any of those things. We're buying the paper and we're working it out. That's how we are making our money. Now, re-performing is my favorite. I mentioned that before. Generally, this is a little longer term play because we, we work with the borrower to stay in their home and we get them to re-perform. This is also called loan modification. Now, I will tell you that I never go directly to a loan modification. I typically will put a trial payment plan in place, also known as a forbearance agreement, but I like to refer to them as trial payment plans because we're not just deferring balance. We're actually giving the borrower a chance to prove that they can actually handle whatever their new payment is going to be. So we do that for a short period of time, about six months. When they're successful, we can do a variety of different things. We can forgive some of the debt. We could forgive all of the debt. We don't have to forgive any of the debt, right? Um, there's certain instances where we don't, um, but we renegotiate the terms of that promise to pay to a place that's comfortable for them and manageable for them. And we get to make money doing that. It creates a win-win. So in our example, let's say we are, because we're owed $120,000, Let's say we forgive, we, we will agree at the end of the trial payment plan to forgive $20,000 of that debt, right? So now we're looking at making $100,000. We're going to probably ask for a small deposit up front, a little skin in the game, right? Maybe $1,000. And then we're going to cash flow it for anywhere between six and 12 months. Um, so we're generating a chunk of cash and stream of monthly cash flow in the same vehicle. And at the end of the 12 months, well, at the end of the six months, it converts to a permanent loan modification. And at the end of the 12 months, you can hold on to it, right? And cash flow it. The beauty part of this is that you are not a landlord, everybody. You are the bank. So when the air conditioning breaks, they're not going to call you. They're going to call the AC repair guy because it's their home. You're their lender, but you're still creating that passive income and having that same cash flow. OK, now you can hold on to it at the end of those 12 months. You can sell it to another performing note buyer. There are note buyers that are out there that do nothing but buy performing loans. So you're going to sell this this note that you're now owed. It's been modified to one hundred thousand. Right. You're now going to sell this note at a small discount, maybe 10 to 15 percent discount to another note investor. Right. So maybe you're going to make that ninety thousand dollars but you've cash flowed all the way through, okay? So again, values in the eye of the beholder, people that are accustomed to staying in their home, living in a home, they wanna stay. So they don't care if they wanna stay, they don't care how much their house is worth. They just wanna know that they can manage the payment and someone's willing to work with them and give them a second chance. And we get to build our wealth doing it, okay? So again, creating chunks of cash and streams of monthly cash flow. Now, unfortunately, we do not have time to go into um, a, a massive amount of detail. I do that at the workshop. Um, but how important is due diligence? It's not just note investing, everybody. Due diligence is key to uncovering the things that are not right, right? The hidden potential pitfalls. Due diligence is, is just paramount. Now, I like to say in the note space that good due diligence will give you virtually risk-free note investing, okay? 
I also say that there is no such thing as a bad note, but there is such a thing as buying notes badly. This sounds great, everybody, but there are pitfalls. I don't want you to misunderstand this. There's, it's not easy, um, but it, once you become educated, it, it's very lucrative. The other thing that's really cool about note investing is that the bulk of your time is going to be spent prior to your purchase of the note, meaning your due diligence, your time is going to be spent doing your due diligence. Once you buy the note, you hand it off to your external team members. Remember, we had workout costs um, that allow for external team members. So you hand it off to them and they do the heavy lifting. They are the ones that liaise between the borrower and you. I don't talk to my borrowers, largely because I have a very big heart and they have a story, right? Everybody's got a story. Um, further, I am not a licensed debt collector. There are certain CFPB rules and regulations, certain RESPA rules and regulations that I'm not allowed to say to a borrower. I can't threaten a borrower. Um, and so I put in place my external team members who are licensed debt collectors to liaise between the borrower and myself, okay? So again, they do the day-to-day -day heavy lifting after we buy the note. So your time is gonna be spent largely just doing the evaluation on the asset that you're looking to buy. And once you buy it, then you hand it off, okay? So that also frees up my time for me, which I love. All right, so we've got a few more minutes, so we're gonna go through some case studies, okay? This one is an owner-occupied single-family residence in Richmond, Kentucky. This family had been there and had not paid their on their mortgage since April of 2012. Yes, there is still inventory out there like this, you guys. Now, our all-in for this note, uh, non-performing note, that's NPN, is $49,252. That is the note itself purchase price and the workout costs, all right? Owner occupied since 1998. Because I did good due diligence, I had a feeling that these people were going to want to stay, okay? Now, there was some equity, by the way, in this house. It's gone up exponentially since then. I still have this note in my portfolio, cash flowing. Um, but, but at the time, there was a little bit of equity, okay? All right, so the legal collectible balance, that's LCB, is 95,000 and change. They had a huge interest rate of 10.99%. The husband had had a medical condition and couldn't work for three years, which was why they stopped paying. But since then, he had gotten better and gone back to work, but they were so overwhelmed and so behind that they couldn't, they just felt helpless and none of the big banks were willing to work with them, okay? Um, we bought the note. Our borrowers were contacted by our loss mitigation team. And of course, they wanted to stay in the home. We put a trial payment plan in place for six months. We required them to pay a good faith deposit, a reinstatement fee, whatever you want to call it, um, of $1,000. Okay, that's a chunk of cash. Now, when you are in trial payment plan, everybody, that money gets applied to the old loan. So it's almost like free money because when you put the modification in place, that's when your new clock starts. So when you're in your trial payment plan and you take a deposit and you cash flow for six months, that gets applied to the old loan, not the new terms you're going to put in place and modify to in six months. Okay. That's free money. You're going to see that in just a second. Okay. Now, the borrower paid their six months worth of TPP payments. What we did is we took what the new terms were going to be in six months and we created the payment, what the payment was going to be. And that's what we were going to put as a trial in place. Okay. It did not affect the loan balance, but it was as a trial. Now their payment based on a small reduction in their UPB, um, and I'll get there in a second, uh, equated to $608.40 per month, okay? Now, you're going to see, you see here that they paid $708 a month for six months. The reason for that is our loss mitigation team has what's called a success fee. The borrower paid that over the course of the six months uh, in their trial payment plan. So I didn't even have to pay that fee. 
At the end of six months, their payment reverted to the $608.40. And um, we reduced that money, uh, the, the amount owed uh, to $87,500. We also reduced the interest rate to 8%, okay? And we made the payment manageable by making it a 480 month, which is a four year term, okay? So we cash flowed during the trial payment plan. We had $1,000. Plus we cash flowed for six months at 42.48, right? Plus $608 and 40 cents a month for the remaining six months. So cash on cash return for year one was 25.5%. Now, what I wanna point out is that if you've ever looked at an amortization schedule, right? The amortization schedule shows, again, we put the, we put the new loan at $87,500 at 8%, after six months. So we reset the clock completely. $580 of that $608.40 is interest. Everybody, you make your profit, not only by the appreciation that you find and you build in, but you make your profit with interest. And that is pure profit to you, okay? The borrower gets to keep their house. We created a win-win situation all the way around. I still have this uh, performing note in my portfolio. Now you could turn around and sell this at the end of 12 months uh, for somewhere around, you know, it, what's what's 10% off of that. So we created a win-win situation, right? This is how I invest in real estate. <laughs> all right. Here's some other examples that I really quickly want to show you. I can't go through all of them, but I just wanted to put them up here. Um, Memphis, Tennessee, non-judicial foreclosure state. We took this one up here to the upper left corner. It was the worst house on the best street. We took it to foreclosure auction. We had invested our full all in on this was $30,175. We sold it at foreclosure auction to a third party. Our, our net profit was $27,861. Took us five and a half months return on transaction meaning the just for that return in, in five and a half months was 92%. Return on invested investment, if you equate that to 12 months, ends up being 184% return on investment. The next one next to it, Memphis, Tennessee, again, foreclosure auction sold it to a third party. All in for this note was $30,854. Uh, six months it took us, we net profit, over the amount that we were into it for, we, we net profit was $35,362. Again, return on transaction, 115%. Return on, on investment is 230%. Okay. Um, Wooster, Ohio, here's a judicial one up here in the upper right corner. Uh, foreclosure auction, we invested 37,000 and change. Our return net profit was 30,000. We sold it to a third party, seven months, 81% return on in, uh, transaction, 115% return on investment. Uh, Richmond, Virginia, foreclosure, we did not sell it. It came back to us as an REO, okay? So we sold that. Um, we actually carried the paper on this one for a little bit, uh, just a very short term. Uh, while they got the funding in place. So we kind of bridge funded our own deal, right? So foreclosure, we sold it as REO. Our investment was $27,000. We had a net profit of $13,897. Six months uh, turnaround time, 51% return on transaction, 102% ROI. Uh, one last one here, Stanley, North Carolina. This one we actually had to rehab, okay? Foreclosure we did not go, it did not sell at foreclosure auction, it was an REO. Um, we rehabbed it ourselves. Our total investment, including the rehab, everybody, $58,000 and change. We sold it for 91, somewhere around there. Our, our final uh, net profit was 21,000 and change. It took us 12 months to do it. 36% uh, percent return on transaction and also return on investment. Now, I'm going to say something to you. Yes, these all look good. Of course, um, you know, are all of these home runs? Some, most of them are. Yes. Do I have home runs often? About a couple times a quarter. I usually have home runs. Have I lost money on notes? Yeah, I have. 
Here's why, okay? Normally we anticipate, it's kind of like our rehab costs. We anticipate 12 or 16 months. If a note takes a longer period of time, right? If it takes a longer period of time um, and we only anticipate closing or workout costs for 12 months, if it takes us 24 months, then yes, I've had to come out of pocket. I've taken a small little loss. Uh, there have been where we don't see inside because you can't see inside the property. And so we have further damage that we didn't expect. Um, and so we had to rehab the property as opposed to selling it. Uh, and, and, you know, when you anticipate all of those hard money costs, you know, for the lender, for the rehab, um, I have taken some small losses there. Generally, though, my losses occur because of time, right? Not because of lack of due diligence, not be, it's mostly any loss that I have ever incurred has been nominal and it has been because of time, okay? Um, I go through, my team goes through, my, uh, myself, we go through very serious and, and articulate step-by-step -step detailed due diligence. So our, if we have losses, it generally comes because of the time factor, not because of the due diligence factor. And of course, that's something that I teach you um, at, the, at the workshop. So that being said, you've heard me mention the workshop. It is called the Building Wealth with Notes Workshop. It is in two weeks, everybody. It is coming up November 5th through the 7th. It is three days. It is virtual. It's via Zoom. Three days, hands-on, all day long. We not only teach you, but we role play, we have fun, we network, we have lunch together, there are prizes, I make it really, really fun, and you're going to learn a ton. Um, I only have two of these a year because I am an active note investor, I do not have time for more. I also limit it to 50 people, because I want to make sure you guys, especially on due diligence day, are going to have tons of questions. And so I want to be able to answer your questions and, and, uh, make sure that you understand completely what I am teaching you. Okay. Okay. So now again, it's virtual, but it is live. Now, normally it's 697 for all three days, but because you're part of JJ's group and I love JJ's group, 597 for all three days. If you want to bring somebody, it will be an additional 197. This is the code to use. So you go to cashflowchick.com forward slash JJ R E I M N. And that is going to show, it's going to register automatically the 597 instead of the 697. Also, because you're part of this group, I normally charge for this, but I'm going to give you the recordings of all three days for free. Okay. I mean, I'll come back to this slide um, in, in just a second. Now, if you're unsure, but you just want some free stuff or you want both, go to cashflowchick.com forward slash free or forward slash info, I will send you a bunch of information for free about notes and note investing. My contact information besides it through the group, and I put the Building Wealth with Notes uh, workshop in there, that was the link, but you can reach me uh, via email, info at cashflowchick.com. If you go on my website, you can schedule a 30 minute call with me for free directly on the website, cashflowchick.com. Of course, Instagram at the cashflowchick, um, and then, of course, uh, all the different social media is, is Cashflow Chick as well. So I thank you for your time. I hope you're excited um, and that I opened your eyes to a whole bunch of possibility, uh, especially being real estate investors in this group. Uh, I hope that you find notes as fun and exciting as, as I find them each and every day. Uh, and it's just such a thrill to be able to share that with you um, and help you grow your portfolio and your financial independence. So thank you.